joy and peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here we go. These are the fruit of the spirit. Walk in the spirit. The Holy Spirit. These are the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit. All right, this morning we're beginning a brand new message series uh, on the fruit of the Spirit. So if you have a Bible uh, or if you have your your phone and your Bible app, you can go ahead and find Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 today. But we're going to talk about uh, certainly one of my favorite uh, subjects and maybe one of your favorite subjects today, and that is food. How How many of you, that's one of your favorite subjects to talk about, food? Absolutely. Uh, we know those that just won the gift certificates. That's one of your favorite subjects now, uh, food. But I want to talk about good food, good food. Uh, you know, a sign of good health is a good appetite, and a good appetite is satisfied with good food. But here's the thing about good food. Uh, how I define good food, and let's say maybe how my doctor would define good food. How many of you know could be two different definitions? Uh, I define good food as primarily through taste. You know, what tastes good to me? So by my definition, uh, Krispy Kreme donuts would be good food. Um, Probably my doctor would not label Krispy Kreme donuts as good because I primarily judge what's good by taste. Uh, My doctor would judge what's good on the basis of nutrition. Not is it good to me, but is it good for me. And we're going to talk about fruit over the next seven weeks. And fruit is one of those things, I know for me, it may not be for everybody, but I know for me, fruit is one of those things that fit in the category of good for me, but also good to me. Uh, And so there's nothing better uh, on a hot summer day, you know, when you come in and you can get a glass of water and and get an orange, you know, and just get the juiciness of an orange and it's just refreshing and it's nutritious and it tastes good. You know, to me, that's one of the most perfect foods uh, that there is. It's fruits good for digestive health. It's good for anti-aging health, for intellectual benefits. There's a lot of good things about fruit. And fruit is one of those things that actually plays a large part in the scripture from Genesis all the way through the Bible. I mean, think about this. Uh, Mankind's first diet was fruit. Genesis chapter two, verse 16, God tells Adam and Eve, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden. The psalmist said in Psalm chapter one, verse three, that the righteous person is like a tree planted by streams of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived in Proverbs 11 verse 30, says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Then Jesus himself said that you would know uh, true teachers and true believers versus false teachers and false believers by their fruit in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus would also go on to say, he would tell his disciples in John chapter 15, that I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. So the Bible has a lot to say about fruit. Why does God place such an emphasis on fruit and a strong desire that we bear fruit in our lives? I believe because it's God wants us to live a life that is good to us and to others, and a life that's good for us and good for others. He wants our lives to have flavor. Somebody say flavor. Somebody say flavor. He wants our lives to have flavor. He wants it to be flavorful and fruitful. So much so that when people see our lives, they would see that the the fruit that we have in us is flavorful and it's attractive. Where they would say, whatever you have going on in your life, I want that. And that's what we all want. I believe we all want to live a flavorful life. And what would it look like if we lived, if, if more people lived a more fruitful and flavorful life? I mean, what would that do in our homes? What would that do in our marriages? What would that do in our relationships? 
How would your job look? Come on, somebody. How would your job look if everybody there was more fruitful and flavorful in a good way? What would our communities look like? What would our interactions look like? What would our cities look like? What would our politics look like? Oh, my. You know? What would our churches look like? Oh, my. If we had more fruitfulness and flavorfulness in our lives that is good for us and good for others and good to us and good to others. I believe that that kind of flavor, that kind of fruit would make a big difference. So we're going to talk about fruit over the next seven weeks. We're going to talk about the fruit of the spirit that we're calling one fruit with many flavors because there's many flavors to the fruit of the spirit. But here's the question for you today and here's the question for me today. How fruitful, how flavorful is your life? How fruitful and flavorful is my life to others around me? That's the question. Is our life flavorful to others? Does our life as Christians, I'm speaking to those who are believers today, our life as believers, do they attract people to the Jesus in us? Or do they repel people from the Jesus that we show the world around us? Does your life define itself by the good flavors that God would have it to. Because here's the truth, we all bear fruit. Everybody in this room, everybody in the world, we all bear fruit. We all have a flavor. The question is, what kind of fruit are we bearing? What kind of fruit are we producing? Because the problem is that not all fruit is created equal. Not all fruit is the same. And the Apostle Paul recognized that not all fruit that comes from our life is the same. And not all fruit that comes from our life is beneficial. So in Galatians chapter 5, he's talking to believers. That's his primary audience. He's talking to Christians. And he's talking to them about the different areas of life. And, and the different ways in which we can live our lives. And so I'm kind of defining these three ways that Paul lays out how we can live our lives as three kinds of fruit. And so we want to pay attention to the fruit that we're bearing in our lives. And we're going to go on a journey over the next seven weeks talking about these kind of fruit. But let's break down in Galatians chapter 5. If you're in Galatians chapter 5, here's what I want to look at today. I want to look at three kinds of fruit that can be produced in our lives. Three kinds of fruit. Now, if you notice, beside of me today, I have three baskets of fruit up here with me. And these three baskets of fruit, they represent the three kinds of fruit that we're going to be talking about today. All right, so here's number one. Number one is artificial fruit. Somebody say artificial fruit. Artificial fruit. Artificial fruit. This first basket here is a basket that looks really good, actually. This, this is a good-looking basket of fruit. The problem with this basket of fruit is that it's artificial, is that it's not real. It even sounds real, you know? I was expecting it to be hollow. You know what? This is good quality fake fruit right here. This is Hobby Lobby fruit right here. This is a Dollar General fruit, all right? This is actually pretty, it feels pretty real. It could be a little heavier, but it sounds pretty good. This is a good fake piece of fruit. So it looks good. You know what the problem is with this though? It's fake. It's all shine and no substance. It's artificial. So no matter how good the fruit in this basket may look, it's all fake. You can't eat it. If you ate it, it would taste like styrofoam probably. Uh, it would not be good if you tried to eat this fruit. It's artificial. No matter how it looks on the outside, on the inside, there's nothing of substance that's there. So the first kind of fruit that the apostle Paul talks about in Galatians 5 is artificial fruit. 
So let's read Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, what is he specifically talking about here? We're going to find out. Notice what he says. He says, mark my words. And this was something that they were dealing with in the church at Galatia. This is something the believers were dealing with. He says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised according to the law, because that was what was in the law. If you were going to be a part of God's covenant uh, as a Jewish person, you were going, every male would be circumcised. So he says, I tell you, if you let yourselves be circumcised according to the law, Christ will be of no value to you. If you think by doing this religious ritual that you're going to be right with God, uh, then Christ has no value to you. He says, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised according to the law that he's obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law, you who are trying to be justified by religious works, you that are trying to be justified by keeping the rules, if you're trying to be justified, trying to be made right with God by keeping the law, it says you have been alienated from Christ and have fallen from grace. We have a misrepresentation today. Usually you'll hear the term fallen from grace by a Christian that's fallen into some sort of sin. That's not the definition of falling from grace. Falling from grace is not falling into a sin. Falling from grace is falling out of grace back into law, back into empty religious rituals. The truth is you and I, when we do mess up and we do sin, thank God we don't fall out of grace. We fall into grace. And I'm thankful for that. But to fall out of grace means you've stopped trusting in Christ and you've started trusting in yourself for your own righteousness. You've started trusting in your own works. You've started trusting in the outward things that you can do in order to be made right with God. He says, through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, any of these things that we do according to the law, has any value. Here's what has value. The only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So what's happening here in the context of Galatians chapter 5 is that you've had this, these churches in Galatia who um, are Gentile believers, they're not Jewish people, but they've had these Jewish people come in and say, and they say, you have Jesus, that's great, you have Jesus, but Jesus isn't enough. Believing in Jesus isn't enough. Faith in Jesus isn't enough. You have to have Jesus plus something else. Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus the law. Jesus plus works. Jesus plus religion. Jesus plus self-righteousness. You have to have Jesus plus something else. And what that leads to is that you're literally stopped trusting in Jesus and now you're trusting in your own goodness, in your own works, in the own religious system that you are in to be good enough, to get you to heaven, to, to, to get you saved and all of that. And Paul is coming against that. And he says, it's not these outward things that matter. It's an inward thing that matters. And so what, what do you have when you have outward works, but nothing happens on the inside of your life? You know what you have? Artificial fruit. Artificial fruit is people that will sit in church their whole life and they'll hear messages and, and they'll sing songs and they'll go through the religious motions and they've never had an encounter with Jesus. They know church, but they don't know Jesus. They know the religious rituals, but they don't have a living relationship with God. And it becomes outward fruit. It becomes fruit that is outwardly, it looks good. I mean, this looks like good fruit. This looks like the best fruit out of all of these baskets. But the problem is it's fake. It's shiny on the outside, but there's no substance on the inside. It's all show. It looks like fruit. You know, we can sit it on our, our coffee tables at home and it looks good. It looks like it's fresh and ripe all year round. 
but it's deceptive. This kind of fruit in the life of a believer is dead religious works, going through the religious motions with no transformation of the heart. So they can say they believe in Jesus, but then they can be mean as a snake. They can say they love Jesus, but then hate everybody else. And this kind of fruit just loves, I don't know why, but this kind of fruit just loves to show up in churches. It loves to show up in churches in form of hypocrisy. And it loves to show up in, in churches in form of, of judgmentalism and, and being better than thou. That's how it loves to show up in church. And it shows up in churches all over the place. And artificial fruit is the reason a lot of people will not even walk into the doors of a church because they went before and all they got was artificial fruit. All show, no substance. All shine, no nutrition. Jesus dealt with people like this. They were called Pharisees. Paul dealt with them in Galatians. They were called Judaizers. Jesus dealt with them in his time. They were called Pharisees. And here's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. They were outwardly religious. They looked good on the outside, but inwardly they were spiritually dead. Here's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He says, woe unto you Pharisees and teachers of the law. You are hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside is dirty. It is full of greed and self-indulgence. Now, how many of you, when you're washing dishes, you just clean the outside, but you leave all the stuff, all the residue, all the mess stuck to the inside? None of us. We clean the inside because that's the part that matters. That's the part we're eating out of. That's the part we're, we're drinking out of. So when we clean, we wash our, our dishes. We clean the inside. We make sure it is clean. Jesus said to the Pharisees, no, you clean the outside, but you leave the inside dirty. He says, woe unto you, Pharisees, teachers of the law. You are hypocrites. He said, you are like tombs that have been whitewashed. They look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside is just a dead person. And that's what Jesus says about these religious people. They were as religious as you can get, but they had no inward heart transformation. They had no true heart for God. Their religion was a show. It was artificial. And so this fruit loves to show up at churches. This fruit is self-manufactured. Is, is self this was made in a factory, in a warehouse somewhere. It was not grown organically from the ground. It was manufactured. So many people, they, they manufacture their faith. They manufacture their fruit. It's just what we do on the outside. But on the inside, we've never fully surrendered to Christ. We've never fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit that's in our lives. Jesus said this about those artificial Pharisees. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The fruit we're talking about that God wants us to have is not manufactured. It's not legalistic commands. It's not trying harder to keep up. It's cultivating a spirit-surrendered heart. Because you can't force the right kind of fruit. You just bear the right kind of fruit. So that's why Paul says, as he wraps up this thought in Galatians 1.6, he says, for in Christ Jesus, circumcision according to the law doesn't matter. Uncircumcision to the law doesn't matter. He says, the only thing that counts and here's our word if we want to live a flavorful life, is faith expressed through love. A living faith, a living trust in Jesus, a living dependence on the life of Christ on the inside, expressing itself through love. Paul says is the only thing that matters. A flavorful life is defined by a life of faith. Not religious works, but trust and transformation. So your life will be flavorful when you bear fruit by faith, not manufacture it through works. So that's the first kind of fruit that the Apostle Paul talks about. Well, there's a second kind of fruit that he talks about as well. And the second kind of fruit the Apostle Paul talks about is symbolized by this basket right here. Here's what number two is. Number two is what we call rotten fruit. Anybody want to come and eat this banana in front of all of us real quick? Huh? Yeah, no, that needs more than prayer. It needs to be thrown away. 
This is a basket of rotten fruit. Rotten fruit. Uh, it's moldy. Uh, it's mushy. Uh, it's bruised. It's literally dying on the inside. But here's the thing about rotten fruit. Uh, I sent my wife out to the grocery store to, to get some rotten fruit yesterday. And I said, I want you to go to the grocery store and I want you to see if they will give us some rotten fruit uh, that they're getting ready to throw away. Because I doubt many people go in and ask for rotten fruit. Uh, so maybe they'll give us some rotten fruit. And you know what? They wouldn't give us rotten fruit. We had to buy rotten fruit. Here's the point in that. Rotten fruit will cost you in your life. All right? Rotten fruit will cost you in your life. It, it's, it's not good, but it will end up costing you. So the first thing that Paul deals with is plastic fruit, fake fruit, artificial fruit. The next thing he deals with is artificial fruit. So here's what the Apostle Paul says about, art, about rotten fruit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Notice what Galatians 5, 13 says. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. So in the first part, He's talking about being free from the burdens of the law, being free from the demands of legalistic religion, being free from the demands of all that. But here's what happens. Some people will say, all right, I'm free from legalism. I'm free from religion. I'm free from the law. Therefore, I can go and do whatever I want to do. I'm no longer bound by what the preacher tells me. I'm no longer bound by what the church tells me. I am free. And I've got this freedom in Jesus. And now I can go off and I can do whatever I want to do. And they go from one extreme to the other extreme. So here's what he says. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But, but, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law, and even the Judaizers know that the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But, he tells the church, if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he says in Galatians, he goes on to say, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh, so that they are in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. So that's not even an exhaustive list. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God of God. So he says this kind of fruit is rotten fruit. It's not pretty. It's bad fruit. As I said, it's moldy. It's mushy. It's literally dying on the inside. You know, this fruit uh, will probably make you sick if you ate it. And this fruit for the believer represents a life controlled by our flesh. Now that's a churchy word. Uh, what do we mean by flesh? What does it mean to be controlled by the flesh? That literally means to be controlled by our own desires. And I don't know what that desire looks like for you. I know what it looks like for me, but we all have desires. We all have impulses. We all like to indulge in things. But Paul says, when we're controlled by our desires when we're controlled by our indulgences, when we're controlled by our impulses, it leads to decay. It leads to stuff that will be rotten in our life. It will lead to regrets. It will lead to hurt. It will lead to broken relationships. It will lead in the way that we don't want to live our lives. 
Nobody wants to live their life and their life looks like rotten fruit. We want our lives to look like a different kind of fruit. And he says, for the life of a believer, and here's the big contrast, the life of the believer is led and lived in, controlled by, governed by the spirit. Not controlled and governed by the flesh. Because I know, you know, because I know, because we're all human and we live there, every time we act on impulse, every time we just go after our desires, it usually ends up not working too well. So for the group that says, hey, I'm free from religion. And listen, and, and y'all know I preach freedom from religion and freedom from the law and grace harder than any other preacher that you've ever met. But here's what happens. Somebody grabs hold of that and they'll say, you tell me I'm free, you tell me I'm under grace. Therefore, I can just go and do what I want to. Here's my response. I usually have two responses. Number one, I would say, okay, tell me what it is you really want to do that you are not doing before because the church told you not to do. All right, what do you want to do? All right, you want to go and cheat on your spouse? You know, you want to go beat up somebody? You want to go commit murder? What do you want to do? What do you want to do that you are restraining yourself because of, of law and church? What do you want to do? Because that will answer a lot about where our heart is, okay? Then the second thing I would say is, all right, go do it for six months and then come back to me and tell me how it went. Go and do every kind of, you know, fleshly thing. Go, go and chase your desires. Go, act, go on your impulses. Go do it with all your heart and then come back and tell me if it was worth it. Tell me if your life is better because not many people will tell you that their life was better because of it because it will cause us a lot of heartache. It can destroy our lives. It can destroy our families. It can destroy our career. It can cause us to be hurt and us to hurt others. That's what rotten fruit can do. And so rotten fruit is one of those things that Paul says, we don't wanna live by the flesh. We don't wanna live being controlled by our desires. We don't wanna live controlled by just what we want to do. We don't want to live controlled by the cravings that we have on the inside of us because it will usually end up costing us. Just like this fruit costed something, even though it's rotten and no good and we're not going to eat it. You know, that's what Lisa says. She's like, I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> it's still going to cost you because it always does. So Paul tells us, you know, it may feel good. It may taste good to me. That's going back to that Krispy Kreme stuff. It may taste good to me, but it's not good for me. So this kind of life of rotten fruit just lives to gratify our desires. Immorality, impurity, idolatry, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, and then it says, and the like. So that means you can just keep naming stuff. You can just keep naming stuff. The flesh promises freedom. Because that's how he started this, this section. You've been given freedom. The flesh promises freedom. It promises happiness. It promises joy. It promises ease, but it cannot deliver. It just brings you into another kind of of bondage and it leaves you empty and it leaves you broken and it leaves you trapped. That's not the flavorful life that God has for you. It's life in the spirit that promises true freedom. Freedom from the law, yes. Freedom from legalistic religion, yes. Freedom from the demands of heavy burden uh, religion, yes. But also freedom from the life that will cause us pain and hurt and suffering and brokenness. Because if you haven't noticed, everywhere that we look around us is pain and hurt and brokenness. And it's because... Many people's lives are looking like this because we're chasing our own desires instead of for the betterment of ourselves and the betterment of others around us. Your life is flavorful when it produces true freedom. So your life is flavorful when you have faith expressing itself through love. And your life is fla flavorful when you have true freedom, the freedom that comes through the Spirit. Now we come to our third kind of fruit, and you could probably guess 
what kind of fruit this third basket of fruit is. This is not artificial fruit. This is not rotten fruit. This is good fruit. This is good fruit. This fruit, if you were to bite into this apple right now, it would be crunchy. It, it would be juicy. It, it would be nourishful in your life. This is good fruit. You know, you, you can eat it. Uh, you know, that one may even look better than that. But sometimes, you know, the real, you know, the fake stuff is kind of too good to be true. Uh, but you bite into this, it's cardboard. It's styrofoam. You bite into this, it's an apple. This is real fruit. This is good fruit. And this is fruit that's not just good to you, but it's good for you. It's nourishing. It's refreshing. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So Paul says it's the fruit of the Spirit that is the life that God wants us to live. Not an artificial life, not a rotten life, but a good life. A good life based on the Spirit. So here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He begins this by saying, but the fruit of the spirit. Now think about what we just talked about. Immorality, impurity, greed, selfish ambition, hatred, all of that stuff. Now think about these qualities and tell me which ones would be better for people to bear in their life. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law, because there's good. You don't need to outlaw the good things. The, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step. Let us walk. As we're walking, let us love by the Spirit. Let us have joy by the Spirit. As we walk, as we keep in step with the Spirit, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. This is good fruit. This is fruit that is produced as we're walking with God. Not in religion, not by just how we feel, as we're walking with the God who loves us, the God who gave his life for the world. This is what our life produces. As we're walking with the Spirit and He's producing love in us and peace in us and kindness in us, those are the qualities that should define believers. Those are the qualities. Without qualifying, yeah, but, no, God doesn't care about the but. He cares about the fruits of the Spirit. This is a result. It's the evidence of God's Spirit working in us. It's the evidence of of us walking in freedom, true freedom, not bondage. The results of walking in faith, not dead works. The results of relying on God's grace, not relying on the law. It's the results of transforming our heart, not conforming to some set of religious codes. And this is the kind of fruit that lasts. Jesus said about this fruit, he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you will do nothing. But in me, you will bear much fruit. And so over the next six weeks, we're going to be talking about nine different flavors of the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to start with love next week. But I want you to see that a flavorful life is formed when you have the fruit of the Spirit. So three words I want you to remember. I want you to remember the word faith. A living faith that expresses itself in love. I want you to remember the word freedom. Not freedom that, that binds us to a, a life full of regrets, but freedom that allows us to live as God has created us to live. And then I want you to remember the word fruit. Faith, freedom, and fruit that God wants to produce out of our lives. So again, as we close, as our worship team comes back up, I want to ask you this question again. What kind of fruit are you producing? You think just coming and sitting in church and doing the religious rituals and being a, a good church person is going to do it, while at the same time we have negative attitudes and judgmental toward others and 
are really spiritually empty on the inside, all show and no substance. Or maybe your life is defined by rotten fruit. You come up and you say, you know, Mike, Michael, I have tons of regrets from following my desires. I would say, yeah, I do too. And you may say, the life that I'm living kind of looks like that. And I'm at a dead end. And I don't know what to do. And my life is full of hurt. It's full of pain. It's full of regret. And I've just done what I want to in no regard for for others and I've just lived gratifying my own desires and not thinking or caring about God or Jesus or anybody else for that matter. Or you may say, you know what, I desire, I've seen some fruit in my life. And that's the thing, when we come to Christ, we don't become perfect. We don't become perfect. We, we, we're, the fruit of the Spirit is still being cultivated on the inside of us. And it will be cultivated through our whole lives. But you know what? I believe that we can, we'll be able to look back on our life and say, man, I may not be perfect. I may not be where I totally want to be, but I see how God has brought me from where I was. I see how angry I used to be, how I used to snap off at my, my family and I, I used to have a horrible temper all the time and people would have to walk on eggshells around me, but now I can see how, we call it mellowed out but it could be how the Spirit has worked in my life. And how, you know, I used to be judgmental and I used to not like people who didn't agree with me, and, but now I look at people different. Because the fruit of the Spirit, this isn't manufactured. It didn't come from a factory. It grew from the ground and it produced. You don't manufacture fruit. We can in our own ability love some people, but God in us can. Sometimes we can't be patient in our own self-righteousness, but the Holy Spirit in us can do a work. And that's what this is about. These next six weeks are not going to be a how-to. It's going to be a, here's what the life looks like. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help cultivate this in my life so that I can love more, that I can be patient more, that I can be kind, that I can show forth the fruit you have in my life. So I don't know what what your basket looks like but I know what God wants it to look like and no matter which one it is God today can begin to do away with the bad fruit because I'm going to leave here today and this is going in the trash and we're going to take this home and we're going to eat this and today God can replace the fruit in your life he can replace the negative hurtful desires the selfish desires with desires that would honor God and honor others in your life. Let today be the day new fruit starts growing in your life. Let today be the day you say, God, I want true fruit to grow in my life. May we stand together this morning.